Welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. Today is September the 24th, 2017. Our guest today is Oren Gray. Hey, Oren, how's it going? Good. How are you guys? I'm doing good. Uh, last minute computer problems fixed. That's good. <laughs> um, I'm going to give away today, I'm going to give away a copy of Autumn Cthulhu. So if you want a copy of Autumn Cthulhu, if you're a listener and you'd like a copy, you can get on that in on that anytime this week. Again, this is the 24th of September. Um, send an email to lovecrafteasingprizes at gmail.com and just put Autumn Cthulhu in the subject. Tell us how awesome we are in the body of the email, especially how awesome Kelly Young is. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, lie is what I'm saying. And I'll pick somebody randomly a week from now. So, all right. Let's do introductions. Let's start with Kelly and work our way over, and then let's talk to Oren. I am Kelly Young. I am the executive, executive, executive editor of Strange Eons Magazine. Oh, you saw my tag, did you? I did. <laughs> Pete. I am Pete Rollick. I have been rejected from Strange Eons four times. Really? I, you know, really? I, I've often said that that magazine has no class, but I'm, I'm going to take that back now. Yeah, is that true? No, it's only twice. It seems to me like we take stories from anybody. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Uh, yeah, Philip, you got a story in there, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> take offense to that. Exclusive. Okay. Is Philip. it my turn to introduce it's, myself? It's, it is your turn, yes. Oh, uh, Philip Fricassi, uh, screenwriter and author. Most recently of my collection, Behold the Void. All right. What about you, Rich? Rich is new to the podcast. He's a... Uh, uh, guest panelist. He's a patron, so at that level. Hi, Rich. Rich Bunting. I'm just a Lovecraft Easing fanboy. <laughs> we'll take it. And uh, Rick. Rick Lay, a writer who has yet to submit to Strange Eons. Get on that, Rick. You'd get in immediately. No, he can't. He owes me a rewrite. <laughs> I owe him a rewrite with an injured hand. I got to do that this week. No. Kelly, do you guys read the stories before you publish them, or is it just an automatic, if you submit, you get published? No, I can't read, Mike. You know that. That's true. Okay. Um, okay, Oren Gray is the author of Painted Monsters and Other Strange Beasts, and also Monsters from the Vault, Classic Horror Films Revisited. Do you have one collection out or, or more than that, Oren? I have two. Um, one of them is not. So before Painted Monsters came out, I had an earlier one, uh, Never About the Devil, that came out from a publisher that right. didn't know it very well, and it kind of, no one has a copy. But uh, <laughs> it's actually coming back out any day now, um, and it will be launching at the HPLFF in a hardcover, like a deluxe hardcover version. So oh, that's it will nice. be back out really soon. I, I pre-ordered that, or I'm very excited. No, I'm still waiting for my copy, bitches. It's, uh, it's not out yet. It's coming from the printer like next week, so soon. All right, so I was reading the introduction to uh, – well, sorry, I introduced you, but anything you want to – you want to introduce yourself to? Oh, that's a pretty Who's good introduction. Who's gray guy? <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty good introduction. I write weird stories, and I write about monster movies, and that's mostly it. I mean, I write a bunch of other stuff to pay the bills, but it's boring, so we don't want to talk about it. All right. Well, you want to, you want to talk about monsters then? I love talking about monsters. And I get the feeling that Rick especially will want to get in on this conversation quite a bit. Uh, but I was I was reading your introduction to Monsters from the Vault, and by the way, that's available in print and for Kindle. So after we after you listen to us today, if you want to, yeah, let me put you on the screen there. Hold that back up. <laughs> if you want to get a copy of Monsters from the Vault and you want to read it today. Um, it's available on Kindle as well as the print version. So, and I was reading the introduction, and one of the first things that I found interesting was um, that you didn't see any of the, uh, let me just read this, I didn't see any of the classic horror films of yesteryear, the universal monsters of the 30s and 40s, the Hammers horrors of the 50s and 60s until after I had graduated from college. So how did you get into monsters and monster films? Well, like, I've always liked horror films, and I've always liked monsters. Um, and when I was a kid, you know, I watched the stuff that was around when I was a kid. And as we, uh, I was born in 1981, so, you know, I watched, um, I watched 
some of the slasher movies, but mostly I watch like Gremlins and Tremors and Lake Placid and and uh, all that kind of stuff that have the, you know, the stuff that came out when I was when I was a kid. Um, and I, I like a lot of a lot of later horror fans. I think I, I found the older stuff and I found it kind of slow and I found it clunky and I, I don't know it didn't it didn't appeal to me because I hadn't seen much of it. Like so I didn't have a, a palette for it yet. Um, and as I got older and kind of learned that I was into movies in general, not just the movies that I was already familiar with, I started to kind of try and watch more different stuff, you know, just things that I hadn't seen, things that were older or from other generations. And I realized that, that I had to, you know, I had to kind of develop a taste for them. I had to get my palate ready for them. It's like if you eat, you know, I don't know if you eat. Mediterranean food or something for the first time you may not like it the first time you eat it You may have to eat like two or three dishes and then you'll be like, oh man, this is actually really good You know, you just have to learn To be ready for it. I don't know. Right. Anyway, and uh, no, that makes sense. Okay. As, as I got started watching them, you know, I started to learn how to watch them and how to see what they had to offer and I fell in love with them uh, And you know, then I just I devoured everyone I could get my hands on after that um, I came to these movies late. I'm still reading from your introduction, but when I finally came, I fell in love with them and I fell hard. Uh, there's no other category of cinema that I love with the same totality of myself, the same abandon with which I love the rickety old monster movies of the past. And you also talk about old movies just seem to capture weirdness better than new ones. Talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, I've got a, I've got a line in uh, in one of my stories that's in Never But the Devil, actually. That's um, so the story itself is called The Seventh Picture, and it's this kind of found footage e horror movie about some people who go and try and track down this lost film by a director who's basically a thinly veiled William Castle or Roger Corman type. Um, and yeah, in it, at one point, one of the people who's who's there trying to do this documentary uh, talks about talks about this exact subject and then puts my words you know, into her mouth. And, and basically it's that, you know, there's something about the fact that the movies don't look too real. Like they're not, they're not striving for the kind of naturalism the modern movies are striving for. They're stagey and like the backdrops are painted and the trees aren't real. And you know, there's these fake trees growing into the fake ground. And there's all this, you know, and, and something about that artifice makes it all feel unnatural in a way that the weirdest modern movies don't quite capture you know, a lot of the time. I mean, there are exceptions, of course. Um, like a really good example that's a little bit later, but it's Suspiria, which is a movie where, you know, Suspiria does a great job of capturing weirdness. And it's, you know, part of why is because it's dubbed in every version you watch it and it's dubbed because it was filmed with no AD, like no sound. So everything's ADR. Um, all the all the backdrops are fake. You know, all the walls are fake. They're clearly fake, and that makes it seem like there's something sort of lurking behind them all the time, because you know they're not real, and that that disjunct, that theatricality, captures something at least for me. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. So, Oren, the the son of Frankenstein, is just. Full. It's it's like an exercise in in in, in black expressionism. Absolutely, yeah. Um, the, the, no one would actually build stairs like that, or right. you know, it's just it's all done just for to create a mood for the film. Right. Yeah. Like the then there's like these like twenty foot tall doors and shit everywhere. Yeah. Right. And then I love that, I love that movie. And you bring up uh, you know the dubbing of of Suspiria, but and you know. Where that I think it's where it's a genius bit on the director's part is not in Suspiria but in Barbarian Sound Studio mm -hmm. to do it completely in the opposite direction. Oh yeah, to create a movie where you only ever get to see the dubbing. Yeah, um, you know, just a great throwback and a flip to to the kind of thing that you're discussing. But yeah, great movies, weird scenes. A sense of weirdness that just didn't exist in this in the slasher films of the seventies, right. which which were kind of rooted in the in this. Oh, it's every it's every town. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Um, well, and you, you talked about Son of Frankenstein, but, you know, I mean, it goes all the way back to, like, the German silent films that were, you know, German expression of silent films where the architecture was intentionally not real. Like, it was, you know, tilted doors and painted on shadows because it was supposed to, like, the architecture was supposed to convey an emotion. It wasn't supposed to just be a real house that a real person would live in. You know, it, it was all... It was this very different thing. And, and I... You know, and I love that. And I love modern movies, too. I mean, I love you know, all movies from every era do things well, but I love that aspect of old movies. And you don't see it as often in stuff after the 40s. Oh. Hey, Oren, you, yeah. you know, most of us in this genre, we we all come to this as kids and love these movies because they're, you know, taboo or something like that, at least at a young age. You came to it as an adult. What was going on that you didn't, latch onto this stuff as a as a horror kid part of it was just that it wasn't and part of it's just that it wasn't there like i you know if 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 i had grown up 10 or 15 years before i did this stuff would have been playing on tv it would have been on like you know shock theater or whatever but by the time i was a kid the stuff that was playing on those channels was a little bit later stuff it was like squirm was on there um the stuff chud that was the kind of thing that, you know, that I got to see when I tuned into whatever the local monster movie station was that or some Godzilla movies, which are great too. Um, but they're kind of their own whole thing. <laughs> um, and, and so part of it was just not seeing them when I was a kid, but part of it was just, uh, you know, I, I watched horror movies forever for, you know, since I was a, a very little kid and I always loved horror movies, but these particular ones, I didn't understand I didn't understand them until I was a little older and I had learned a little more. Um, and then I went back to them. I saw, you know, I saw the, the again, the theatricality of it and uh, the, the reason why it was the way it was. And I started to learn about the behind the scenes stuff, which I'm really interested in and just, yeah, it, it just took some, took some time for me to come around for whatever reason. It boils down to, we're all a lot older than you, I think. Yeah. <laughs> In some oh, cases, wait. like you, way, way older than Oren. Right. <laughs> I, I have a question for Oren. What, what is your favorite version of Dracula since we're dealing with so many different versions from different decades? So we actually... That was weird. We actually did... Um, we actually did a, a viewing of like almost every version of Dracula for Halloween once, like I don't know, like four or five years ago, my wife and a couple of friends and I, and um, yeah, we, we, we went through and we, we ranked them and I would be hard pressed to pick like a movie version of Dracula that was my favorite because every one of them has things they do really well and things they don't do as well. Um, I really love the uh, Frank Langella one actually from the seventies a lot. Yeah. Um, as far as like people playing Dracula, like actors portraying Dracula, my go-to favorite is always uh, Duncan Rieger from Monster Squad, actually, which is a, maybe a controversial pick, but I love I love his version of Dracula in Monster Squad, who's this more like this less suave, more kind of vicious, um, king of the monsters kind of Dracula. So, I that, that's so that's my pick if we're picking just Dracula actors. <laughs> if he had a mustache, I might say he would have been the perfect Dracula. He would, he would have looked a little mustache. Rich, you have a question for Oren? I do. I was wondering, um, you know, horror movies nowadays are tend to be really realistic in terms of, you know, the props and the special effects, etc. Do you think that because we don't have that kind of uh, over-the-top expressionism that you might see in earlier films from the 20s, 30s, perhaps even in the 40s, that we lose something by by movies being so horror movies being so realistic and special effects being at such a state as as they are. I think in some ways we do, but I mean, I think that I think modern horror movies have a lot of things they can do that those old horror movies couldn't do too. So we gain some things as well. But I do think there are some stuff that's going on in horror right now that is actually hearkening back more to that than we may realize. 
Um, I think a lot of the stuff in, like, I'm, I'm a big sort of famous defender of the Insidious movies, which I know most of my peers do not care for. But I think they are doing, I think they're doing more of that than is immediately apparent when you just glance at them. Um, I think there's more of that sort of uh, what uh, Gemophiles called it vaudeville creep, um, which I think is a good, you know, I, I think there's a lot of, of that sort of older fashioned almost silent movie mummery kind of stuff going on in them than then you notice when you just when you just watch them at a glance. Um, and then also I, I actually just finished watching Campbell Cove, the, the Channel Zero Campbell Cove thing. The creep yeah, movie. did you like it? Um, I liked a lot about it, but I didn't feel like it came together completely. But it did again it had a, it had a lot of like not just puppets, but it had a lot of like mummery stuff with like people in like really like simple um, paper mache outfits and stuff that they used really effectively as special effects um, and then camera tricks and things. So it had a very, uh, an older aesthetic a lot of the time that again, the, the sort of modern cinematography and very naturalistic story didn't always draw attention to. Whatever that's worth. <laughs> uh Getting back to Monsters from the Vault, um, you know, I'm not the expert that you are, and I I didn't have a, I didn't go to movies growing up or have a TV, so in a lot of in my entire adult life, I think I'm constantly playing catch up on things like this. You know, where, where's the hole that I need to fill here, and so forth. But I imagine there's movies that you could have included in. I'm looking at your table of contents right now. What went into the choices about what you wanted to include and what you and why did you include the ones you did? That what what went into that decision making? So the, the Monsters of the Vault, the actual the, the book itself is actually a collection of all the columns I did for Innsmouth Free Press. So for five years, I wrote a column on vintage horror movies for Innsmouth Free Press. And when I was doing the column, like what helped me choose the movies was two things. One of them was completely selfish, and one of them was a little bit less selfish. The less selfish one, the one that sounds good, is that. I was trying to include stuff that wasn't really obvious. Like, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to include Dracula or Frankenstein or Bride of Frankenstein or whatever, because not only does most of the people who are going to buy a book about Venator films have probably seen those already, but millions of people have written millions of words about those movies because they're classics and they're classics for a reason. They're great. But I didn't, I, I wanted to get into more obscure stuff or less, less often talked about stuff partly. But also partly, I picked things I hadn't seen already, and so it was it was basically a you know this is an excuse for me to get paid to watch this movie that I want to watch anyway. Yeah, I'm working here. Yet. I'm working here. I'm right. Watching the movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and it would let me you know track down like I'd track down occasionally these kind of harder to find things, or you know I got to see um, Dead of Night, which is this great British anthology, one of the first anthology horror films, not the first, but close, from like 1945. And it's, it's brilliant, it's wonderful, I love it. Um, but it's not widely available on DVD, so it gave me an excuse to track it down. Um, and just, so a lot of the inclusions were either me trying to fit some, you know, this is a slightly more niche movie, or this is just a movie I want to see, so here I'm gonna write about it. <laughs> Uh, and I think it was John Langan wrote in the introduction to Painted Monsters uh, about a conversation you had at a convention, wasn't it? I'm going from memory here. And you were sitting at a table at, at a restaurant with Joe Hill and a few others. And he describes the conversation a little bit, says he couldn't add much to it. What were you guys talking about? Uh, his, his reflection was slightly different than mine, but we, we were talking about... Um, we, the conversation went all over the place as they do at conventions, yeah. but um, I mean, we were talking about werewolf movies and we were talking about um, the howling movies and sort of my, my claim to fame moment is that I was the one person at the table who knew which howling movie was about marsupial werewolves, which is the third one. Um, and how do you not know that? Yeah, right? <laughs> you, you, you know, you'd think, I mean, like Steve Niles was there. He should have known that, right? That's right. You know, but anyway, um, and, and, you know, just, and I think what stuck with John was that, like, because the third Howling movie, really all of the Howling movies after the first one are, are fucking bonkers. Um, but 
there's 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 something there. Like even in the worst movies, there's almost always something there that you can you know you can watch a movie and and you can pull something from it that's you know a nutrient or something that you can use for something later. Um, and like one one of the things that I, I did want to mention is you know I, several times I've watched bad movies or not that great movies and pulled a story out of them because there was there was some piece in there that was great even if this movie wasn't uh so in my first collection i've got a story called the bar guest that's actually uh just a retelling of this really shitty werewolf movie that was on mr science theater 3000 just called werewolf and it's, it's awful but uh its idea about how you become a werewolf is great like some people dig up a werewolf skeleton and they cut themselves on it so they become a werewolf and that's fantastic, right? That's great. Yeah, that deserved that deserved a way better story than that movie has. <laughs> <laughs> so, what would you say to someone? Uh, can you kind of give a primer of sorts on monster movies? If if someone hasn't seen a lot of them, we what would you say to them? You say, "Hey, man, you just got to see these, and you got to see this one because of this." What would you say to? How would you start that conversation? Uh, man, I mean, I. I mean, there's I a lot of things the first, you could say, I'm sure. I think the first thing I would do is be, I'd try to figure out what they do like already. Because the worst thing you can do, and this is one of the things that this happens a lot in, in literature classes, in my experience, you know, when you're, in, when you're in high school or when you're in college or something, you just get thrown into this stuff and you're not given any context for it. And you're not given, you're just told, hey, this is great. This book is great. You have to read it and you have to think it's great. But you're not given any tools to think it's great you're just told that it is and you're going to have to agree and you know i want i want people to enjoy this stuff i want i don't want people to to watch you know something that they're not going to like so i want to figure out what they like first and then i want to tell them okay well if you like that you'll probably like this and then from there okay how'd you feel about that one you liked this part of it okay well maybe you'll like this and then gradually you know acclimate them to whatever movie it is i might want them to watch like you know, instead of just throwing them in cold, say, you know, let's 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 develop your palate. Let's learn how. What's the context? What's the. You know, what 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 makes this interesting to you, not just in some grand scheme, but what will make it. What will make it appeal to you, whoever you are. Um, but I mean, you know, if if you want to make a list of of like classic monster movies, you can make a list forever, all day. Uh, yeah. I actually did a. I did a um, Adam Cesar. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's a, a writer. Um, he he had had anyway a uh, a column on Cemetery Dance called Paper Cuts for a while. I don't know if he still has it. I think he does. Um, anyway, he uh, he had me on one time not too long ago. So you can you can find like look up like Paper Cuts or in Gray or something. You'll find it. And we went through and did like what our favorite monster was from every decade mm -hmm. of monster movies, like from you know nineteen twenties up till the present. So there's there's a good primer if you need one. <laughs> well, what do you think is? I don't know. There's so many movies out there, but is there an essential viewing list in your mind? I mean, Some almost kind of certainly. Base. You know, almost, almost certainly like. You know, the, there's there's stuff like you know Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein. Um, I mean, for monster movies, you know, something in the Godzilla realm, obviously the original King Kong. Um, but I mean, if I start trying to make a list, I'm going to keep spinning out just longer and longer forever. Um, and I'm sure there are tons of essential. Well, we we don't care if you talk. That's why you're here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there are tons of essential lists online, but like. Again, for me, I, I think the, the essential thing is just to, to do it in a way that you'll enjoy it. So start with what you already know. Start with what you already like. And then, like, once you find that, find something that connects to it in some way. Like, say, post online and say, hey, I love this movie. What else is like it? And then someone else will say something, and then someone else will say something, and eventually someone will suggest something you haven't heard of or something that's new to you or whatever. And so you pull that, and then you just, you know, you just, you just build up. But... You know, just uh, build build it instead of instead of trying to force it. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Philip, you got a question? Yeah. Well, I was just sitting here listening, and I was also checking out the uh, table of contents of your book, Orin, 
And uh, it got me thinking. I was wondering about if you've ever gone through the the um, if you've ever uh, gone through the process of categorizing horror movies. And I'm just, I was just sitting here in my head thinking through because you kept referring to those monster movies, monster movies. I'm like, well, right, but there's other types of horror movies, right? There's there's psychological horror. There's slasher horror. There's ghost stories. There's and I was wondering if I mean obviously there's some, and there's some crossover like our ghost stories monster movies, you know, maybe does it have to actually materialize? Is Vincent Price fighting a skeleton at the end of, you know, a movie? Is that kind of a monster? Like, have you ever gone through that process of saying, well, these are definitely monster movies and these are definitely would be categorized um, other? Yeah, I, I absolutely have. And lately I've actually gotten a lot of, of, of discussions online about what which movies are horror movies and which ones are not. Um, and in spite of the title, Monsters in the Vault, in spite of the fact that I'm kind of the monster guy, I love a lot of horror movies that don't have monsters in them at all. Um, and one of my favorites, I mentioned this in the in Monsters in the Vault, one of my favorite movies of all time is The Old Dark House, the, the 1933, I think, The Old Dark House. Um, the, 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 this one. Um, which is a, a James Whale movie that he made like between... Uh, between Bride of Frankenstein and The Invisible Man, I think, somewhere right in there, like right in the middle of his kind of golden age of producing stuff. Um, and it does not have even a supernatural element of any kind. It's just, it's an old Dark House movie. That's all it is. It's a bunch of people get stranded in a rainstorm with this weird family. It's actually kind of a precursor of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, if you want to get right down to it. Um, but it's, it's a delightful movie, uh, and it's a movie that I loved so much that I actually went and found the novel it was based on um, and actually helped get it back into print through Valancourt Books, which are these guys who do, like, gothic uh, and old old horror reprints of things that are, like, have been out of print for years. And with their, Really? That's great. Yeah, with their help, I actually I got it, too. I got props all prepared. Um, United? Yeah, I wrote the introduction to this movie. Um, and, cool. Cool. I'll put it back in pretty early. And so, I mean, and there's no monsters in it. There's not even a ghost. There's not, uh, there's nothing. It's just people and creepiness. Um, but I, you know, I love it. And I love those old dark house movies. And there's a whole subgenre of those from the thirties that pretty much never have anything supernatural in them. Um, they're just, they're all atmosphere and, and spookiness and everything. So I love monsters, but I also just like horror as a genre. And I love spookiness for its own sake. Um, so I'm all over the place. <laughs> Rick, you have a question? Yeah, I'd say the old dark house is interesting besides having Boris Karloff. It has the actor who played Dr. Pretorius in Bride of Frankenstein. Ernest Dessinger was wonderful. Yeah, who you, who you, who you probably, who, who's, I think there's like the only two movies I've ever seen him in. Uh, he's in The Ghoul also. There's only three I can think of off the top of my head, but yeah. So, Oren, help me out here because this old house is the same story as Seven Keys to Bald Pate. Sounds which, right, yeah. Which is published 15, early, 15 years earlier by Earl de Biggers. It's, I, I think the stories are different. I haven't read the, um, I haven't read the novel, but if it's like uh, House of Long Shadows. Right. With Christopher Lee and John Carradine and Peter Cushing and uh, probably somebody else I don't remember. Um, Vincent Price. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I think the plots are very different. Well, like, so the old Dark House title, um, by the time that the book was printed, or by the time the movie came out, rather, it was it was like a whole subgenre. So if you go back to the 20s and 30s, there are dozens of movies that were called old Dark House movies, um, mm -hmm. and they were they were almost always like a bunch of people. They come to this house for various reasons. They're stranded by a storm. They come for the reading of a will. There's there's a whole plethora of reasons why they may show up and then they're stuck there for whatever reason and usually someone knocks them off one by one so in that way they're kind of precursors of jello films and slasher films and so on but they're a lot more mannered than, than their later counterparts 
Um, and they're usually, they're usually kind of funny as well. Um, and th there was a whole subgenre of those that kind of died out over time. But th there used to be just, they were thick. Uh, the Bat is one with Vincent Price. Um, the Cat and the Canary is a famous one that they made like three versions of. Right. Um, and so they, there were just tons of these back then. This is just my favorite. <laughs> okay. Warren, you've talked about one or two already, but can you talk about a few of your personal favorites and why they're your personal favorites? What is it, what is it that you like about them so much? Yeah. Um, so the one I always use as an example is uh, this Japanese movie called Matango, which probably some people are nodding, but... Um, it's it's got a couple of other names, but it's actually a an adaptation of uh, William Hope Hodgson's *The Voice in the Night*, uh, done by Toho, uh, directed by um, his name is blanking, but he's the guy who directed most of the Godzilla movies, the early ones. Uh, and so it's it's right in the middle of all the Godzilla movies. It's a Toho movie, but it's not a kaiju movie at all. It's it's just *The Voice in the Night*. Um, you know, so it's it's mushroom people on an island. Um, and it's delightful. Like it's great, great rubber suit monsters, great atmosphere, great weird fiction and movie form, which you didn't get a ton of. Um, and you know, it's, it's bizarre, and it's it's a bizarre moment in history because again, Toho Toho was riding high on Godzilla right then. So why would I do this kind of quiet, small, weird story right in the middle of that? Um, but it's, it's a movie I love, and it's a movie that I recommend to people all the time. Um, and actually, it is the tango here. It is the reason why Sylvia Moreno Garcia and I co-edited Fungi together. So the only anthology I've ever edited so far was the one I did uh, was Fungi, which I did with Sylvia Moreno Garcia of Vincent Free Press. And we it's it's all fungus themed stories. So. Um, mm -hmm. And then the reason that it happened was because we actually got talking about Matango and um, how much I loved it and how when she was a kid, she'd seen it and it scared the crap out of her. And uh, we got talking about mushroom stories like The Voice in the Night and some others and decided you know, we should do a fungus-themed anthology. And from there, we did fungi. So. Okay. What about a few others? Um, a few others, let me think. Uh, so... Um, a couple that I mentioned in Monsters in the Vault, um, Keltiki is this, um, Mario Bava worked on it, but he didn't direct it, or maybe he did direct part of it. There's some debate about that. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a late version of the blob, but it's also kind of gorier than the blob, even though it's from the 50s, maybe early 60s. I don't remember. Um, I think late 50s. And it's, uh, it's, got some some Lovecraftian stuff for like the Keltiki monster in question is this thing that like the Aztecs worshipped and sacrificed people to and um, so on and so forth. Um, so it's a really good one. It's really bizarre and uh, has been hard to find until recently but Aero Video put out a really great Blu-ray which is why I just held up so now you can get it. Um, I love just about any of the Hammer movies. So you can just pick pick a Hammer movie, more or less at random. I'll probably love it. Uh, some of my favorites are the Vampire Lovers, um, Night Creatures, which is a weird one because, again, there's actually no supernatural element in it. Um, but it was the first Hammer movie I ever saw, so I've got kind of a soft spot for it. Um, yeah, any of the Frankensteins they did, um, the Gorgon, which is them doing a monster that's weirder because it's a, you know, Medusa. Um, most of their monsters were vampires or Frankenstein. Um, and uh, so those are a couple. Um, let's see, one other one I pulled out is uh, The Undying Monster, which is mm -hmm. a John Brom movie who's better known for The Watcher, but uh, he did this in Hangover Square, which are both really good. Um, and The Undying Monster has kind of a goofy ending, but a lot of the movies from back then had kind of goofy endings, so it's one of my favorite of the goofy endings because I'll, I'll spoil it, but the twist is basically that the guy wasn't a werewolf. He just turned into a wolf under certain circumstances. How that's different, I don't know, but they seem to make a distinction. <laughs> the shocking twist. Right. 
<laughs> um, so yeah, those those are a few uh, off the top of my head that I that I thought to bring along at least. Um, hey, Oren. Yeah. Um, so you were a horror kid for you know forever. What was your first favorite horror monster, and has that changed now as you've been finding these other films? My first, so I don't know what my first one was like when I was really young. Um, I remember, you know, I remember liking Tremors a lot. Tremors might have been the first one that really got me when I was really, because I saw it in theaters. Um, so I would have been like nine or ten or something. Um, and and I still love it. I still love the good the movie. Grab yeah. The grabouts from Tremors. Um, so it might have been the first one, but the first one that I really really remember like what I'd call like having a fandom for almost was aliens actually, which I saw the first time it was broadcast on TV. Um, and I didn't actually know there was an alien at that point. I didn't know there was a movie before it. So watching aliens without knowing that it was a sequel was a really weird experience because it's this kind of movie that drops you in the middle of a story, which was really revolutionary for me. I was like, holy crap, this is amazing. Um, <laughs> Had I known that there was a movie before it, I don't know if I would have reacted quite the same way. But for a long time, Aliens was my favorite. was was kind of my favorite horror movie, and then the Xenomorphs were a big, you know, favorite of mine. And over the years, I, I definitely think I still like them a lot, and I still love to, uh, you know, I don't know, write like a licensed alien novel or something if anybody ever wants me to. Uh, but um, I, yeah, I don't know that they're my favorites anymore. I and mean, some others have definitely eclipsed those, uh, like The Thing. Has had eclipsed those over the years, but I didn't see it when I was as young. So, yeah, the thing and uh, aliens, I think, are my two, my personal two all-time favorites. Nobody asked you, Philip. Oh, well, just <laughs> throwing it out there. Hey, I had a question, Oren. I was wondering what, uh, because I'm a man of uh, the present and the future. Wondering what um, I don't know what that means. I was wondering what you thought. What in the last I was few years? Say, what, what does that mean? What I don't know. Just, <laughs> just, just roll rolled out of my brain and out of my mouth. Um, All right. I was wondering, we, in the last couple of years, you know, with the, with it coming out and being what will end up being probably the biggest horror movie of all time as far as box office gross is concerned, what, um, what movies the last few years uh, would you would you call standout films, um, whether it be indie or big budget or straight to video or, or whatever? And you mentioned Insidious, but I was wondering if there's anything else uh, recently that you really was really impressive uh, to you um, well I haven't seen it yet because I've been sick um, so I made it out to the theater but I'm going to sit, go see it soon so I'm excited uh, I mean I'm trying to think like so um, and obviously Get Out was the big standout horror film this year for me Get Out was amazing I mean there's no monster in there or anything or, or you know not not the cool kind of like rubber gooey monster anyway um but uh i mean it was amazing uh, the witch was amazing last year um you know and I'm, I'm sure i'll forget a bunch of others and some that that don't get as much like they don't get talked about as much but that i really liked were uh like the taking of deborah logan from a few years back which was a found footage thing that i thought was done really well um that was good yeah i like yeah. that i like that one yeah, and the, the guy who directed it i don't think i've seen that that's good, you're saying? Yeah, I really liked it. It was on Netflix until yeah. recently. Yeah. It still is. Okay. Netflix. That's, the, that's the one about Alzheimer's, right? Yeah. 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 I forget. Oh. Uh, Let's see what I did there. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, <laughs> Kelly's shaking his head like, what an idiot. <laughs> um, anyway, Oren, go on. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, those are, those are, I'm sure I'm forgetting tons, but those are just a few that pop into my head. Uh, another one that I, that I really like that doesn't get talked about a lot is The Canal, which is this like Irish movie. Um, it's got the guy who was in the Hellboy, the first Hellboy movie in it. Um, but it's uh, like the movie itself, like the plot isn't amazing, but a lot of the stylistic stuff and a lot of the, and the, the plot's fine, but it's, it's pretty standard. But a lot of the stylistic stuff and a lot of the visuals are just incredible. Um, there's some kind of Hellraiser-y kind of stuff with like walls cracking open and there being things on the other side and that kind of stuff that I just thought was really brilliant in it. Um, so I know those are a few that, that jump into my mind. Uh, weirdly, there haven't been a lot of, like up until this year, there weren't a lot of monster movies that were also horror movies. So like most of the monsters in movies have been in like, 
adventure movie, like been in, in superhero movies or sci-fi movies or something, been in, in these kind of bigger budget, you know, Hollywood blockbuster movies is where you found monsters and, and horror movies have been more concerned with like either, you know, naturalistic like home invasion stuff or um, ghosts for the last, for the last few years. But this year has been weird because this year we got it obviously, which is a big budget monster movie. Um, but we also got um, some like weird big budget attempts at like monster e movies. You had Kong Skull Island, which is, you know, a throwback to the old, Kaiju, you know, King Kong movies and stuff. We had uh, the the Tom Cruise Mummy movie, which isn't great and it's mostly an action movie, but it is still, you know, it's a monster. There's clearly a monster in that movie, um, and it's it's clearly you know in in the horror sort of circle. So we're getting more monster movies this year that have bigger budgets. And I'm curious to see what's going to happen with that in three or four years' time, with the success of it, with this, you know, with right. this. this Godzilla shared universe thing that's going on and I'm gonna see I'm curious to see where where that goes as far as Having more monsters in movies that are more horror movies Yeah, those King Kong Godzilla movies are rough man that yeah. dark that dark universe is really that's, that's a swing and a miss I think um, uh, Yeah, it is, a, but a very expensive swing and a miss. I was wondering what you thought of the the I, I a movie that I really liked um that didn't didn't get a lot of love, but I thought it was kind of cool. Was the uh, the thing prequel that came out about five, I don't know, about five years ago? I guess. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, it, was, it was just called the thing, but I thought that movie was pretty badass. I liked it. It had some good stuff. I had some problems with it, but it, it had a lot of alien CGI at the end was yeah. off putting. The, the, they did a weird thing where they tried really hard to square it with the beginning of the original, but didn't quite. Which frustrated me. Like they came so close and tried so hard, but then missed, which was weird. Um, but you know, it was. It certainly wasn't bad. I mean, you know, as, as as prequels to maybe one of the greatest horror movies of all times go, it wasn't. It wasn't as bad as it could have been. That's for sure. What? Uh, there's the last question, but I apologize. Just because I'm very no, curious. You're fine. Uh, yeah. Because because um, it was so divisive. There, people really, really hated or or. or I don't want to go as far as they really loved it, but there was definitely some positive and negative. Was the 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 void the recent uh, horror fan wet fantasy that came out uh, years ago, whatever few months ago? What did you get to see that one? I did. I saw it um, at, at a Panic Fest, which is a local horror movie festival that we have. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm pretty in the middle on it. Like I think you described it pretty well. It's kind of like a, a horror sort of wet dream. It it was. It was great in a lot of ways. It looked great. Um, it was a little dark. Like the lighting was a little dark to see some of the effects. But for the most part, it looked really great. But it 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 sampled so heavily from other things that I felt like it never really established its own identity completely. It just felt like a a party tape people had made from their favorite parts of like Hellraiser and The Fly and you know Prince of Darkness and all this other stuff. Um, but yeah, that, that's me. Other people really loved it. So, yeah, Kelly told me if you're not into body horror, then you shouldn't watch it or something along yeah. those lines. Isn't you, Kelly? Yeah, it's it's got a lot of the stuff that you have told me specifically. You do not like in films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got scads of body horror about every kind you can imagine. So, yeah, no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I like I like I like ghost you know supernatural horror I like ghost stories I like I like quiet horror quite a bit you know that that's just me but um, yeah. you know are there any stories or novels horror novels or horror stories that you've read that you would like to see get made into a a movie Oh man yeah I'm, good lord I'm sure millions um yeah talk about a few of those uh um, I'm trying to think. I mean, we were just talking about the void and the thing and stuff, and I, I just finished reading um, Tony McMillan's An Augmented Fourth, which is from Word Horde, so I'm sort of obliged to plug them because they put out my second collection. Um, and, and I love all their stuff. But uh, By Word Horde, yep. Yes, by Word Horde. Ross is a um, great guy. Uh, but it, it, it would make a great movie. It's, um, it's kind of the thing meets uh, From Beyond, but with like rock music. So like all the characters are thinly veiled, uh, you know, variations on, um, you know, Black Sabbath and uh, 
David Bowie and shit like that. And they're all trapped in this snowy hotel. And, um, yeah, there's, there's weird thing like monsters. It would make a great movie. Say that title again. This is relevant to my interests. An augmented fourth. An augmented fourth. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a really short novel. So it's a really quick read, um, which I like because I'm, I am, I have very little patience for big, like doorstop novels. Um, so I, I don't read them very often. Uh, but, um, yeah, I really liked it. I think it would make a great movie. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that Laird Barron's done that would be hard to translate to film, but if you did a good job, I think it would make a great film. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, They Remain, which is Phil Gillette's take on one of Laird Barron's stories that's going to be playing at the HBLFF. I'm super excited about that because Phil Gillette's a cool guy also. Yeah, he um, is. And, he's, uh, a, he's all right. <laughs> he's 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 a very nice guy too. He was kind enough to blurb my book, so I have to I have to say he's cool. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of. Uh, I mean, so okay. you, well, let me back up for just a second. You said you don't like doorstop novels, so you're not into most of the Stephen King novels. No, or is I, I, read, I read I read some of them when I was a kid. Um, cause like, so, so when I was a kid and I was first getting into horror, you know, I, we, we were poor and, uh, you know, we got, we got our movies from the like 59 cent section of the video store and we went to the dollar theater. And if I wanted to read a book, I got it from the library. Um, and you know, Stephen King was who they had at the library. Right. So they had like tons of Stephen King. So I read quite a bit of it. Um, I actually, right. actually never read it, but I did read a lot of his other stuff. Um, but even back then I liked his stuff, but I was also discovering Clive Barker at about the same time and Clive Barker like was more of my particular jam. So the way that everyone else sort of, uh, and a lot of my peers, you know, if it weren't for Stephen King, they wouldn't be writing horror. And for me, like Clive Barker is closer to that than King. So I don't have that same real connection with his stuff, even though I've read a lot of it and liked a lot of it. So, you know, if somebody asked me this question, I don't know how I would answer it, but um, <laughs> why is so I don't know if you can either. Maybe you can. But why are you into horror? You know, just a very basic question. Why? How did you get into it in the first place? And and why are you still? Why do you write it? Why do you read it? Yeah, I honestly can't remember. Like, I've been into it for so I've been into it for literally as long as I can remember. Like, so when I was a kid, yeah. um, it, these are the stories I always tell. So when I was a kid, I watched. I watched monster movies on like the, there was a Saturday morning show that showed monster movies. I watched those. Um, I read those Crestwood house monster books. I don't know if anyone's familiar with those. They were these orange board books about like old black and white horror movies like Godzilla, uh, King Kong, Bright Frankenstein each had one and they'd have like stills from the movie in them and stuff. And we had all of those at my school library. And so I read all of those. I like, I stared at those pictures from the movies and would, would imagine, you know, the, the, the story or the world or whatever that that picture must be from because it was so evocative to me at the time. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and so, yeah, I've done that for as long as I can remember. And so I, I, I've always liked monsters and I've always liked sort of spooky, creaky stuff, graveyards and, and spooky houses and cobwebs and all that jazz. Halloween. Um, yeah, and I was about to say, and Halloween, right? <laughs> right. Um, and uh, it helps that my birthday is the day before Halloween, so um, I've got a you lot know, of where I'm, where I'm from in Iowa, that's actually the day before Halloween is actually when everybody goes out trick or treating. I don't oh. know why. I don't know oh. why they did that, but yeah. ever since I can remember, everybody goes. They were celebrating my birthday on the thirtieth. <laughs> What'd you say? They were celebrating my birthday. Yeah, yeah, must have been. That's clearly it. <laughs> um, and yeah, um, and so, you know, I, I, I've always been really into it. I know that what, like, flipped the switch to make me know that it's what I wanted to do was reading um, Mike Mignola's stuff on Hellboy. Uh, you know, reading, reading Hellboy comics and reading, reading all those. And I, I, I read those and I just, I realized, you know, this kind of stuff. This is what I want to be writing about. Because before that, I, I dabbled in, you know, I dabbled in science fiction, I dabbled in fantasy, I dabbled in, uh, you know, literary fiction stuff when I was in college. Um, but but once I started reading those Hellboy comics, I was just like, this is everything that I love the most. This is what I want to be writing about. 
Um, and that kind of clicked that, you know, okay, this, this has always been something I love, but it's really what I want to be doing. Right. So, well, speaking of what you want to be doing and what, what you like doing, you've got two collections out, right? Yeah. Um, talk about those for those listening who have not delved into those yet or don't know about them. Talk about those for a second. Okay, yeah. So, um, Never Met the Devil was my first collection. And again, it came out in 2012. And at the time, it was basically everything I'd had published up to that point. Um, so, I, it's, it's, it's a collection I'm pretty proud of, but it's also all my early stuff. Um, so, I, th I hope that you can see me evolving from it to the later ones. Fingers crossed. Um, but there's a new version of it coming out. Uh, coming out in just... Again, it'll be launching at the HP Lovecraft Film Festival, so in two weeks, um, from Strix Publishing. It's going to be hardcover, fully illustrated. Um, it's going to be really gorgeous. I'm really excited. Uh, How can you get that if you're not going to be at the film festival? It's So it's been on pre-order. It's not on pre-order at the moment, but it's going to be being available through the Strix Publishing website. So it's just like Strix, S-T-R-I-X, publishing.com. Okay, S-T-R-I-X. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so Google uh, Strix and Painted Monsters, or pardon me, not, not Painted Monsters, Google Strix and Never Bet the Devil, and you'll probably find it, I would imagine. Yeah, you should be able to find it, yep. And I, I will be posting links as soon as, like, it goes up for regular sale as well. Um, so if you follow me anywhere, you can, you can find it there. Uh, and then Painted Monsters, which was my second collection, which came out in 2015 from Word Horde, put it back up again, is, um, it's kind of germane to the conversation because as I was putting it together, like originally when I, when I, when I went to, to Ross with the idea of doing a second collection, I kind of had this idea already, but as I was putting the stories together, it, it coalesced more and more is that all the stories in it are actually inspired by film in some way. So like they all tie into film in some way. Um, uh, some, some of them more obviously than others, but you know, every story is, is, is tied to horror film in some way. Either it's inspired by film or a specific film, or it it's actually about a film or something like that. Um, and so, as I was putting it together, I actually go in order through it. So the stories go from the silent films of the twenties up through like modern movies with found footage and ghosts and all that stuff. Um, and then the last story, the title story in it, which is in the novelette, um, is kind of this mush of all of that together. So it's got influences and references from the earliest film all the way up to contemporary stuff. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of an old dark house story and it's kind of a wax museum story and it's kind of a modern monster story. And it's kind of a lot of things all just crammed into one uh, with, with this um, third generation horror movie producer as its protagonist and so that's how i get kind of some of the history of the horror cinema crammed into the story um and i'm really proud of it i think it's kind of the most me thing i've ever done because it's a bunch of my favorite stuff all in one story mm -hmm. um, so uh but yeah so if, if you read if you read the collection it, it's it's very much just sort of a history of a history of horror movies in in the form of a bunch of fictional stories <laughs> So yeah, what what are a few of the stories that that you're riffing from? Um, so like it, it varies a lot from story to story. So like did I say stories? I meant m movies. What what are a few of the movies that you're riffing from? Um, Excuse me. So like one of the one of the earliest stories in the book is called Night Bird, and it's about a girl who um, really loves silent horror films because she lives in the twenties, and this weird tenant moves into her house, and she she thinks is a vampire, and so it riffs on. Um, yeah, we're on Nosferatu and on Marinos Faust and on uh, the Lon Chaney Jr. Uh, London After Midnight, which is lost film, so we've never seen it, but she would have been able to because it wouldn't have been lost then. Um, and so it riffs on all of those. Um, then, you know, some later stories, uh, there's a story in there that's from Ross's Giallo Fantastique anthology, so it riffs on Giallo films like Suspiria or Deep Red or Blood and Black Lace. Um, there's a story that's inspired directly by the, the 1930s version of Merge on the Room Morgue. Um, there's a story that's a fictionalized version of the making of this weird Korean 
kaiju movie called Plugasari, which involved like the Korean government kidnapping a guy to make a movie to force him to make a movie at gunpoint, basically. So there's a kind of weird fictionalized retelling of that. Um, there's uh, trying to think about looking. Uh, there's a hey, um, there's a ghost apocalypse. This will be on the final test, right? There's a, there's a <laughs> ghost apocalypse movie or story that that pulled its plot from a Japanese movie called Pulse or Cairo. Uh, I'm probably mispronouncing that, um, but that that also riffs on a lot of ghost movies that are out recently. Um, because you know, we've, we've had just tons of ghost movies in the last ten years, um, and it riffs on a lot of those. Um, those are off the top of my head. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, Mr. Bunting, I believe you had a question. For yes, Warren. sir. I um, I'm reading through Painted Monsters right now, and. I'm really enjoying it because it really does remind me of the kind of fiction and the movies I watched as a kid growing up in the 80s. And a lot of the, I, I guess the direction, a lot of the direction that contemporary weird fiction and horror fiction is, is, is moving toward or is actually in the midst of is that ambiguity is really emphasized. And I, and I looking at exemplars like Paul Tremblay's Head Full of Ghosts or especially House of Leaves, your stories and the movies that they're kind of inspired by are decidedly not that. So is this a conscious, conscious effort in your writing to move in a different direction than, say, this emphasis on ambiguity and contemporary horror and weird fiction? Partly, um, and partly it's just that it's what I'm better at. Um, but for me, like, a lot of people come to horror for different reasons and a lot of people come to horror to, to accomplish different things. And for me, like what I'm, what I want to do when I sit down to write a story is I want to write something fun. And horror seems like a weird genre to pick to do that, but it's what I find fun. Like when I sit down to watch a horror movie, I, I have fun usually. I mean, even if the, even if the movie is really scary or really disturbing, I have fun. It's what I find fun. And so when I sit down to write, I want to, convey that that fun and i think a lot of authors aren't trying to do that they're trying to make something very um yeah very very serious and very uh and very thoughtful and very complex and i i'm happy if my stuff is also scary or thoughtful or complex but my first goal is for it to be fun without being without being a comedy or without being without not taking it seriously like I don't want it to be a parody I don't want it to be a, a joke necessarily even if it is full of jokes but I do want it to be fun and I don't want it to be fun for the reader I want it to be fun for me um, and so I think if, if, if there's if there's a, a conscious reason why I'm different from that that would probably be it it's just that you know this is I'm, I'm just having fun this is what's fun for me <laughs> yeah I think I think the word you're looking for is you you want to be entertaining, you want right. to, which is one thing I always focus on is I, I want my stories to have layers and I want them to have things that you can, you know, emotional depth and all that other stuff. But you also want to entertain people. And that's, you want people to, same with movies. My, th my number one thing with movies is I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's about, you know, your dead child in the house fire or if it's about, you know, ghosts coming out of the closet. I think your number one priority as a filmmaker is to entertain. And even if that's done in a very thoughtful, provocative way, or if that's done in a very subdued, subtle way, quiet way, I think you have to entertain. Um, and I think it's, yeah, I wish, frankly, more writers made that a priority. But it's, I'm glad that you do. I like your stories as well for that reason. Uh, Warren, you mentioned scary a couple of minutes ago. Are there any recent horror movies that you found actually scary? So, um, again, if you, if you want if you want to hear me ramble about this more than I'm about to, um, and more coherently, <laughs> I wrote a I wrote a um, uh, uh, Nightmare Magazine has a column that they run every 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 issue. It's called the H Word, and it's it's a different right. layer every time. So mine was about whether or not horror needed to be scary to be horror. Um, and and in it, I talk a lot about how that that's not really what I'm trying to accomplish, and it's not really what I'm after when I go to horror movies. But at the same time, I talk about how there's a lot of different kinds of scary. And when you, know, when, you when someone asks, you know, 
if a horror movie is scary, like what kind of scary do they mean? So like a lot of the a lot of the much maligned, you know, jump scare movies like Insidious and The Conjuring or whatever, they the good ones, uh, they do a good job of making you jump. That's a kind of scary. You know, someone jumping out of the dark yelling boo, that's a kind of scary. And uh, it's not what people usually mean when they ask me if a movie is scary, but um, it is, you know, that some of them are. Uh, as far as, you know, more disturbing premises, I mean, um, obviously, you know, Get Out is a funny movie and it's an intense movie and it's a great movie, but it's also a, a very scary movie as far as on a social level, you know, that it's dealing with very real issues that are very real and scary, like racism, um, which, you know, is a troubling thing. Um, in real life. So, you know, um, I try to think of some others, uh, that, that have found, I mean, in, I, I find I find some movies very intense. I find some movies very disturbing. And so I have a hard time pinning down what, what scary really means in a given situation. Um, like, yeah, uh, you're right. Cause there's, there's jump scares. There's a movie that disturbs you profoundly. That's a different type of scary. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre is very scary, but it's very scary in a very different way from, you know, The Conjuring or something, whatever, you know, whatever your example may happen to be, or or even, um, you know, I don't know, I'm trying to pick a name out of the hat, but, you know, Alien or whatever. I mean, they're very different in how they're scary. So it's yeah. it's a, a lot of... Uh, a lot of different but one thing I, I do really look for is I like it when movies can surprise me um, because I've seen so many of them that like genuinely taking me by surprise is rare, especially since I, I know going in, I know a lot about the movie going in usually because I'm active in a lot of, of movie um, fandom online um, and I'm, I'm active on a lot of movie websites and that kind of stuff. And so I hear a lot about movies before I see them, which means I often don't get to be taken by surprise much. And so I like it when a movie can take me by surprise. Um, I just saw a movie called Better Watch Out. It's not actually out yet, but will be soon. And it completely took me by surprise, but the trailer for it just came out, and the trailer gives fucking everything away. So don't yeah, see the trailer if you can avoid it. Because <laughs> I enjoyed it a lot when I didn't know what the hell was going on, but the trailer would have wrecked a lot of that. Um, Martyrs from several years ago, the French film Martyrs is a really good example of a movie where it just like takes a sharp right turn, like just every 15 minutes or so. So what the movie is about at the beginning, what the movie is about at the end are completely different. Um, and so that one's one that it, it's also pretty scary, but it's also very surprising if you watch it without knowing much about it. So you That's mentioned, in your... <laughs> I'm sorry. That was just me dodging the question a lot. No, 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 no. That was you're fine. Uh, you mentioned that being entertaining. How important that is. What? Just to build on that a little bit. What does success as a writer mean to you, um, personally? So, um, I mean, it's changed a little bit over the last few years because of I guess four years ago, I uh, actually quit my job and I've been writing full time ever since. Um, and most of that is uh, freelance work. So I'm writing websites for companies or I'm writing uh, blogs or social media posts for, for used car lots or whatever. And, and my name's not attached to it. It's, it's all, you know, anonymous freelance work. Um, but because of that, uh, you know, because I'm doing it full time, because I'm doing it for a living now, making a living at it, it, it's changed my priorities as far as publishing fiction too, to some extent, just because I have to think of everything in terms of, you know, how much time is this going to take? How much, what's the, what's the reward at the end kind of stuff. Right. But um, like from a more artistic standpoint, uh, I, I love it when people like my stories. I think that's what it boils down to. Like I, I'd love to win an award, you know, I'd love to, to make a year's best, I've made a year's best once, which was really exciting. Um, but the thing that is the best for me is when someone just tells me they really liked my book or they really liked my stories or something. And for me, like that's, you know, I'm, I'm writing stuff for people who want the stuff I'm writing and success for me is just, you know, is just being able to keep doing that. Um, and 
I've, I've written one novel. It was licensed, so it wasn't really like my personal novel. It was uh, licensed for my gaming company. Um, but I've never written a novel just for myself. I think I will someday, but I love short fiction, so short fiction is kind of where I put a lot of my energy, even though it doesn't pay as well. Um, but I, I love writing it, and I love just putting it out there. And so I guess for me, success is just getting to keep doing that and having people react and respond in a way that's positive. You know, if people like my stuff, I'm happy. Well, f to finish up on something pretty fun, you and I are both quite the Halloween fans, right? Woo! <laughs> Do you have any favorite Halloween memories that you'd like to share? What, what makes this holiday so special to you personally? I mean, for me, I think it's, it's, I always joke that it's my birthdays then, but I think it's, I don't think that's true. It's, it's just that Halloween is when the rest of the world looks like it looks to me all the time. You know, it's, oh, well said. It's, it's, it's full of monsters. It's full of, you know, graveyards and spooky stuff. And, and it's fun. It's scary, but it's also fun, which is my whole thing, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I love that about Halloween. I love the aesthetics of it. I love autumn. Um, and, uh, as far as memories, when I was a kid, I loved going to haunted house, like the, the haunted attractions that they put on, you know, where you go and you walk through a dark maze and the smoky crap and people jump out and yell boo or chase you with chainsaws or whatever. I loved that when I was a kid. Right. Um, and I love, um, and you know, anything like that. Uh, these days I go to, I go to a lot of horror movie marathons on Halloween, which are a lot of fun. Um. But yeah, I just, you know, it's, it's, it's the time of the year when the world is the way I want it to be always. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's well said. Um, what part of the country do you live in? I live in Kansas. I live just outside of Kansas City. So, so you, you get, you get somewhat of an autumn there every year, don't you? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it, it varies a little bit, but yeah, we always get, you know, we always get fall leaves and chilly, rainy weather to some extent or another. So it's nice. Yeah. That's a that's a perfect Halloween weather. Leaves on the ground and soft rain, yep. clouds. <laughs> uh, all right, anything else coming up that you'd like to talk about before we let you go? Um, uh, I don't think so. I think that uh, you know the reissue of my collection, and then um, we're doing a big sort of promotional push for Monsters in the Vault for October. Um, and uh, what's the promotional push? Are you reissuing uh, that book or just? No, it's, it's 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 been out the whole time. We're just we're just it sells better around Halloween because people are looking for monster movies to watch. So we we start talking about it a little more. Yeah, when Halloween comes around. Um, yeah. So if you're at the, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I go ahead. You go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say. So if you're at the film festival, um, you know, pick up. It's never about the devil, right? Is the one that's being yes. reissued. Um. You can get uh, Monsters from the Vault on Kindle and in print. And the same goes of to uh, Pain of Monsters and Other Strange Beasts. So uh, yeah. pick those and up. I mean, uh, I'm hoping to have a third collection coming out in a year or two. But we'll find out. Um, it's still in the works. But, uh, you know, I've sold some stories. There's uh, a story of mine in Autumn Cthulhu. Um, yeah. Uh, the Well in the Wheel. Yes, I got a few others coming out that were out recently, so um, hopefully they'll all kind of get bundled up together soon. All right, well, Warren, thanks for being on the show. Great talking with you. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was fun. Nice to meet you, Warren. Yeah, it was nice to see everybody. See you at the festival, Warren. Awesome. All you got to do is close your browser. It'll kick you out. Thanks, Warren. Um, all right, so let's see, when's the film festival's coming up? When, Kelly? It's two weeks. It's the, uh, let's see, it is October 6th, 7th, and 8th down in Portland, Oregon. So did anyone besides Kelly and me see uh, it? No. I, I know Philip saw it. I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. Rich saw it. All the cool kids. Did you guys like it? We won't do spoilers, but did you guys like it? I loved it. I, I thought the kids did a great job acting. Um, I thought it was funny. 
I brought my 13 year old son. So I was the only parent that had a kid in there. So there were all sorts of judgmental stares, but we had a blast. <laughs> no, it wasn't though. My <laughs> kid, my kid went with all his friends and saw it. He's just, just turned 17 last week, but they, uh, they all went crazy for it. I think it's, and I, it's, it's such a perfect uh, movie for a 16 or 17 year old kind of coming into that, that age group and, you know, the coming of age horror monster movie, I think is a really, I was really happy for him because he was obviously elated. He was like, it was like the most awesome movie ever. You know, <laughs> they could tell, you know, you know, they're going in there, they see kids their own age or similar to their own age, just doing crazy, crazy stuff. But um, yeah, I liked it. I thought it was good. I want to see it again. I, I had, I had an, unex I had an unfortunate theatrical experience because I went with, I went to one of those theaters where they have other people. Yeah, uh, I know what you mean. Which is not, which are is the not, worst. Which are the worst kind of theaters to go to. I prefer the theaters that are empty. Like People with just, phones. Right, like when I saw Mother, that was how I prefer to see a movie. That's when it's just, just the two of us, <laughs> my Stephanie and I, in, in a big empty theater. That's that's the that's the way I like to do it. Yeah, I'd like I, to stay I, on it, but I do want to hear right now. Do I need to see Mother in the theater? No. But you need to. But but you need to sweet. You need to see, you do need to see Mother. It's an excellent, it's a very, very well-made film. It's, it's got, um, the execution is, is stellar. Uh, it's very, very interesting. You'll find yourself thinking about it for a few days afterward, uh, trying to kind of analyze, without giving it anything away, you'll do some, a lot of analysis. Um, and it's definitely, definitely worth seeing. Uh, if, if my one thing with Mother is, why you might want to go see it in the theater is because you don't know what it's, I can guarantee you, you don't know what it's about unless someone who's seen the movie has told you what it's about. Um, all the speculation is bullshit. Like it's all, it's all red herring. Even the studio, like with the Rosemary's baby poster, that was a total red herring. That was purposely done to. Um, this is not a movie that I've even really paid yeah. attention to or know Just, anything about at all. My, my point is, is don't let anybody tell you, about the film, because once you know, you're going to go into it with a different take. But you, you, you know, you'll go into it with too much knowledge. So that would be the one reason you might want to see in the theaters if you don't want it to get spoiled. If you want the, it's the experience raw, it's it'll be much more effective for you. It's okay, worth seeing. Know. It's it's really well done. The acting is, uh, you know, the the cast in that movie: Michelle Pfeiffer, Ed Harris, you know, Javier Bardem, uh, what's her face, uh, man alive. It's a great. What's, what's her face? The new blonde. I right. like that actress. What's her face? Name is she's Lawrence. good. She's good. She's good. Jennifer Mitchell Lawrence. Lawrence. Yeah. Just she's a shy actress. Right? actress. <laughs> oh, are you talking about Jennifer Lawrence? Yeah, Jennifer Lawrence. Uh, yeah, I'm Joe, not, I'm Joe Pulver's fan. crazy about her. I'm not a fan of her, but she's oh. great. In this, she's great in this movie. Um, so, uh, and Michelle Pfeiffer's really creepy and good as well. So yeah, oh. I'll have it's to just, see it. It's, it's just. Yeah, you could, you know. I wish it had gone straight to video because there's no, there's no, there's no point in seeing the theater other than the fact that you don't want to get spoiled. You want to see it before people tell you about it. Well, I'm, I'm not going to see it in the, in the theater because we were talking about this before the show started. Not to be a grumpy old man, but what the hell is with you? These people who can't go two hours without being on their cell phone. Well, the good, like I said, the good news about going to see Mother's, you'll probably be the only person there. It was not a crowded theater. It's not making a lot of money. I've been self-employed for a long time. Back when I was in real estate, uh, before I got sick, I used to like to go to movies in the middle of the day, you know, when absolutely nobody was there. That was a lot of fun. So, um, Hey, Mike. Um, I'm curious yeah. to hear, I think that everybody else here who saw it actually read the book and I know that you have not read the book so I'm curious to hear what you thought of the film going in you know with with no preconceived notions well I did have preconceived notions because I I saw the old it back when it came out so I kind of knew the storyline but oh, I I liked it quite a lot um, most importantly it scared the ever-living hell out of my wife so my my son and I just thought that was hilarious so, so well, I, I thought it was a good story. I'm very curious to see um, 
Because like I've it. heard I've heard chatter about they're doing obviously this chapter two that they're calling it the sequel is going to have the kids obviously grown up. But then I heard a uh, rumor yeah. that they were going to do a third film. Whether it's theatrical or not, I would lean toward it probably being theatrical given the insane success of this film. I mean, it's literally the highest grossing horror movie of all time. So it's about to be. It's going to pass The Exorcist. And, uh, and then they were going to do a, um, a mushed together version where they intercut, where they do it like they do it in the book, where they go back and forth from past to present. And, uh, yeah. and it's going to be like this long sort of three and a half hour or whatever. Um, or more longer version of the film where it's all intercut. The two films are intercut uh, together. That I would I'm I'm would be very very excited to see. I'm hoping they do it at theatrical because I would love to see. I don't think anything like that's ever been done before, as far as I know. I thought I think that would be really really well, cool. It, it sounds like what they did with The Godfather. With yeah, the we were talking about this last movie. week. Yeah. Oh, Coppola yeah. put together all the Godfather movies in a six-hour cut. Yeah, they took the Robert De Niro the flashbacks and added some new scenes and shoved them in front. Oh, I never oh, saw that. that. Hmm. It, was an, it was interesting, and, and you got some extra stuff that you had to see. But if the studio was really committed, they would just wait 25 years. To oh, it. God. I'll be dead. 27. <laughs> Oh, you 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 think right. that movie that what was it was it Ethan Hawke who made that movie over several years? No, yeah. I'm thinking that they should just wait for these kids to grow up. No, but there was that movie where they had a kid growing up. Boy, uh, otherwise known as the load, because it was a load to watch. Yeah, I felt like I was watching it in real time. What a horrible film. Has anybody seen a movie on Netflix called Death Note? I have. We briefly talked about this, and uh, I mentioned that I liked it, and I was spanked like a Japanese businessman at a Dutch brothel. And I, I mentioned that I liked the Japanese live-action version, and I was spanked by a Japanese businessman in a small hotel. This is Death Note. You get to talk about Death Note, the, the manga? Yeah, it but, but it's a live action film on Netflix now, yeah. directed by the guy that did. Well, my son uh, told me the animated uh, series was a lot better. Well, I went in there without preconceptions and I liked it. And now I'm starting to watch the anime and I can see why, where all the complaints come from. But if you go, if you have no conception of, of um, what this movie is going to be about. Yeah, I want to see. I don't like it. Live action version. I like the comics, the manga. Sorry, whatever you call it. The um, I watched a movie last night called A Dark Song. I was just gonna say, does anybody else watch Dark Song? That was magnificent. It's making the rounds on social media, the hype rounds. So I watched it. What's What's it about? Uh, it's about a, a woman who uh, loses her son, and she goes to a, she rents out this old mansion in the middle of nowhere in Wales. And she brings in this guy who apparently knows these rituals to allow her to talk to her dead son. But it's a whole, the whole and the whole movie is about their interaction during these very uh, dark and very secluded ritual rituals. It's kind of really that's what the movie's about more so than the ending or the culmination of the ritual. It's really about I mean, the, 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 their interaction. These two people are stuck together. We don't like each other. But one guy sort of like this high occult, you know, figure and uh, and this, you know, torn up mother. So it's it's really interesting, really interesting film. It's did you say it was on Netflix? It is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I used subtitles it, because I couldn't understand what the guy was saying at the time. Really? Oh, yeah. see, I watch a lot of Brit TV, so every once in a while I mumbles in Irish or. Uh, just published this by William Meikle, Karnacki, The Edinburgh Townhouse and Other Stories. So if you're into Thomas Karnacki, I know Rick is. Um, pick it up at Amazon uh, by William Meikle, Karnacki, The Edinburgh Townhouse and Other Stories. Do you know offhand the uh, artist on that cover, Mike? Because that cover is great. Yeah, it's Wayne. Oh, my God. I can't remember his last name. Uh, yeah, no, I did. Wayne Miller. 
So he does some nice. Work. Yeah, it's a pretty cool cover, isn't it? And there it is again. I like it. It's cool. I like the cover of the new strange, the upcoming strange eons. I mentioned it on Facebook. I mentioned it here. Yeah, Man, thank you for mentioning that is it. A, that is a god blessed, wonderful, just art piece of art. Yeah, Fernando Peniche. Panish. Um, and it was one of those things where, uh, you know how a lot of these artists do something for like art week and they'll draw an image in a day. And uh, he drew that image in, you know, a couple of hours and posted it online. And I just immediately said, I want this. And he was like, wow, okay. Here's your five bucks. Yep. Thing. And when does, when does that issue come out? Uh, I know that it will have to come out before the Lovecraft Film Festival because we have to have copies down there. So, uh, you know, in the next two weeks. Ke Kelly, I, I've had a question that I've always been dying to ask you. The, now, I know Strange Eons is from Lovecraft's Abdul has read poem. But did you take that as a title for that or did you do it because Robert Block wrote a novel called Strange Eons? <laughs> No, we, we definitely took it from from Lovecraft's story. Um, and, you know, that's why we spelled it that way, too, because Blocks, he spells eons in the, uh, the uh, popular updated version. Um, what we did is when I, when I quit Planet Lovecraft, or when I had to quit Planet Lovecraft, um, Rick Tillman came in as the business partner, and we had decided that rather than try and push planet Lovecraft forward, you know, starting at that numbering system at number five, that we might want to expand the, the magazine and make it more sci-fi and horror. And so looking for a different name, we wanted to kind of stay true to the Lovecraft roots, but, but also expand it. And strange eons kind of did that for us. I've had some sound issues on this. I've I've been lowering and and upping volumes the entire hour and a half here. I, I think we're, I'm gonna have to work with you this Rick uh, this week sometime, Rick, on your microphone. Not sure what's going on with it. You're muted right now. In case you're talking. <laughs> after, after we get off, there's something I gotta ask you because I see something. All right. All right. Yeah, yeah we can do that. Uh, okay, we have anything else to talk about? By by Karnacki. That'll that'll make William Meekle happy, and it'll make me happy too. I've got something to plug. Um, sure. Gardner Fox, who uh, was a major DC writer, who did the Flash, all the universes and everything. They've come out with two uh, collections of pulp stories on Kindle. One is called 10, Sto 10 Pulp Stories from Planet Stories, which is mainly science fiction. There's some elements of Lovecraftian in there, but it's really not too Lovecraftian. But the second collection is seven more pulp stories. And it has two, it has a collection, and those seven stories are two Cthulhu Mythos stories, which uh, have been overlooked for years. Okay. okay. All right. Well, anything else? Uh, it's well, I think. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was going to plug something too. I was going to plug, and since Pete and I are both have stories in it, we have there's a there's a there's an anthology that's on the looking for um, that's being fun with Indiegogo. Pete, the, I'm sorry, I'm referring to Test Patterns as an anthology. I think Test Go Find Me. Go Find Me, which and Nick Gupper's doing the cover and. Pete and I both have stories in it, and they're they're about halfway there. So if you uh, Google test patterns, go fund me. Uh, oh yeah, I plugged that last week too. That looks in. interesting. Yeah, it's got a pretty good lineup. I think Joe's it. I think Joe Pulver's in it as well. Yeah, I think so. So it's a good it's a good little good little collection. Um, so yeah, I would like to see it get a little love because I think it's got some good stories in there. Yeah, I you know I took a really bizarre twist. I asked them if they wanted what they 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 approached me to write a story, and I said, "Well, do you want something that I normally do, or do you want something you know with no Lovecraftian references in it?" And they said, "Oh no, no, we want we want Lovecraft, but you know it has to be sort of that Twilight Zone twist at the end, you know." And you've done I've done some night gallery pieces, and I, 
the funny thing is that I just finished a story literally that was inspired by night gallery. It's a Richard Upton Pickman story. And um, so it was, it's funny to come back and literally be asked to write another one of those stories. Um, yeah. But it's fun. I, I had a, a good time with it. Yeah. My story is not necessarily even horror. It's sort of a literary with a twist, but um, it's very different. So hopefully I, I, I tried to give them something a little off the wall. So hopefully it'll, people will enjoy it. Yeah, so if, I would imagine if you Google test patterns and GoFundMe, you'll probably find it. Yeah. The, the other thing that I, I wanted to talk about is sometime in the next 24 hours, Oscar Rios' uh, Golden Goblin Press is going to be releasing more tales of Cthulhu Invictus. Uh, okay. Set in, uh, Lovecraftian story set in ancient Rome. You know, I was thinking when we were listening to the monster stuff, all the monster movie stuff, there really are no, and I guess there are, probably if you really go down deep, but there's not really any big Lovecraft monsters movie. Like, there's never been, or am I, or am I not thinking of it? Like, it just Clover, seems to me it's like Cloverfield? It seems, Is Cloverfield a Lovecraftian monster movie? Yeah, I mean, like, but with the Cthulhu mythos. Like, there's, oh. like, like, people always talk about, like, oh, there's so many Lovecraft movies, so much Lovecraft this, so much Lovecraft that. But really, there's never been like one big Lovecraft, like a Cthulhu movie ever. There's never really been one made. There's been like Lovecraft stories adapted, but there's never been a monster movie really. I'm not sure like, that he's got a story that that is really like that. Mostly we, we don't Cthulhu. get to see the Cthulhu. monster until the very Dagon. end. I mean, they got the original story, not the adaption that was you know really the shadow over Innsmouth. But Dagon almost like a prototype Ray Bradbury story. Well, sure, but it's also eight pages long. Yeah, well, you know, but I, look, they isn't it, the yeah isn't the Dagon movie that's got monsters in it? I mean, not it's got Dagon at the very end. Yeah, I, I I'm unaware of this film. I want to check it out. Stuart Gordon. It's actually not too shabby. Yeah, I like to see Call of Cthulhu, John, and just really done. That. Yeah. Well, what about the unnameable back in the 80s? Oh, man. Mm. And the unnameable, too. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to thumbs down that one. Sorry. <laughs> well, I was thinking from beyond, even though it's not so much a mythos movie, it's got all the mythos elements in it. Yeah, it's got a lot of monsters in it. Yeah, from beyond. And I guess the reanimator is probably the biggest, right? It's probably the most well known. Yeah. Sure. Um, hey, speaking of reanimator, you guys, I don't know if you guys have been aware of this, but um, you bring Dynamite, up, what's that? There's a role, uh, There's a, a, a board game coming out. The board game. Did you get on the Kickstarter for this? I just I assumed not. you would. I did not. I am, and it's got eight days left to go. They've and got, you call yourself Lord of the Reanimated. <laughs> <laughs> they've got... Uh, Ten thousand dollars of their uh, twelve thousand five hundred dollar goal. So it looks like they're probably going to make it. But it's from Dynamite Entertainment, and it's a reanimator board game. It looks really cool. There's a um, there's a King in Yellow uh, edition that they are making available as soon as it actually hits its funding. So uh, everybody, jump on that. Just search on Kickstarter for the reanimator the board game because I want this game. Is it funded already? Did I hear you say that? No, it's not. It needs uh, another twenty five hundred bucks and eight days left. Well, they didn't advertise with me. That's why they're not funded. That's right. <laughs> I'm doing it for them right now. Yeah, you are for free yet. Yeah, no, for free. It, do, it does look cool though. Yeah. Have you guys seen before we go? You know what I just started watching that I think is pretty cool? Fringe. I guess I'm late to the show on this. You're but. just watching Fringe? Yeah. I really enjoyed it, and then I stopped really enjoying it. About yeah. Okay, then. Uh, those first, couple, couple those first few seasons are great, though. Yeah, it's first couple seasons are good. Yeah, it's the ringtone on my phone, the theme from Fringe. Oh, really? Yeah, that's a good piece of music there. It's a neat show. Uh, it just went oh, too, too long. Did it go south? So I need to I need to watch for the for the south. Sometimes you just 
it would just be nice if it was just like just three seasons all in and they kind of wrapped it all up and they, you know how it is and they got they start you know they start jumping jumping sharks you know and start trying to find stuff to talk about and stuff to do and it just becomes i and i stopped watch, i stopped watching it in fairness i, I got about three seasons in and i was and I'll done i think they yeah, did I five followed, five total i followed it all the way to the end and you know they did a lot of deus ex machina stuff that i didn't like mm. if you can sci-fi your way out of your future then what the hell's the point well, I'm enjoying it so far, at least. And I really liked the um, first couple of episodes that were obviously shot wherever it was, Boston, in the wintertime. You know, I um, always enjoy a show that's not afraid to show the show the weather. So it's kind of one of my things. I thought it was nice to see Joshua Jackson pop up, you know, after going AWOL from uh, Dawson's Creek a couple of years before and then he shows up in this really great serious role so that was neat i'm just shocked that you know where that did you you a big dawson's creek fan or oh yeah sure look at do me you have the dvd oh, box set uh, i've got all of the dvd box set. you've got it on blu-ray what are you talking about right, i stood in line at the uh dawson's creek con no 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 I, kelly has the vhs tapes all right, there's a photo of me with Joshua Jackson and Katie Holmes. I'll I'll share it on the uh, I'll share it on the Lovecraft Easy message board when we're done, so you guys can see me when I look when I'm 20 years old, hanging out with those two creepy folks. Yeah, and for those who don't know, I don't think we have we ever actually said this on air, but if you want to not see Philip Fracassi in a film next to Christopher Walken, uh, tell out tell him about that. You're digging a you're digging a grave or yeah, something. Yeah, I, I told the story the, the first time I was on this podcast when you Did interviewed you? me. August. Well, we've, we've got like probably year. a good half a million Mike, new listeners. So Mike doesn't I'm actually sure. listen to the podcast. so Yeah, man. Uh, yeah. Nobody's watched. Nobody watched the original already. one anyway. Yes, when I, when, I, when I was working on The Prophecy, um, uh, there was a scene where uh, 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 the sycophant who I can't remember his name, the actor's name now, unfortunately, um, was digging a grave for Christopher Walken's, and Christopher Walken was sort of perched on the end of the grave, looking down into the grave as the guy was digging, and they were giving dialogue back and forth, and when the shot was from outside the grave, so you only saw Christopher perched on the edge and the dirt sort of flying up, the actor who was in the grave didn't want to go in and do do you know keep digging and do the lines and stuff because it was late and was tired and all this other stuff so the director said philip get in there and throw dirt up for us while christopher does his line so when you see the movie there's a shot and christopher walken is delivering his lines into the grave and you see sort of big <clears throat> tosses of dirt coming shooting out of the grave that's me in the grave <laughs> shoveling the dirt with christopher walken delivering his lines to me which was uh, a pretty a pretty neat neat moment yeah, a little That's surreal. A cool. little surreal. Well, he's he's pretty cool. Walking is. He's an interesting. He's an interesting guy. Yeah. All right. Well, next week we're gonna have Selena Chambers, um, and Asa Pell is gonna interview her for me, and he always does a great job. So, in the meantime, thanks everybody for listening. Again, I'm gonna give away a copy of Autumn Cthulhu this week to uh, a listener. So just send an email to Lovecraft Easing Prizes. I'm going to put Autumn Cthulhu in the subject of the email. I'll randomly choose somebody a week from today. And also, please don't forget about my Patreon. we got tons of extra content and a fiction, Lovecraft and Fiction podcast as well. So um, you and I are going to talk about it as soon as I'm done reading the novel, Kelly, remember? We're going to yeah, do spoilers. I think, that, I think that'll be a good one. Yeah. That is such so a great book. That, yeah, that's an example of Patreon-only content. So just Google Patreon and uh, Lovecraft Easy. You'll come to it. So it's very, very, very expensive. Um, <laughs> five bucks a month. So. And thanks to everybody who is out there supporting me and keeping the lights on. I really do appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for listening. And we'll see.